Episode number 234. It does to me, remember that, my lad. I give you entire liberty, but I trust you to make an honest use of it. Promise me that, Lori. Anything you like, sir. Good, thought the old gentleman. You don't care now, but there'll come a time when that promise will keep you out of mischief, or I'm much mistaken. Being an energetic individual, Mr. Lawrence struck while the iron was hot, and before the blighted being recovered spirit enough to rebel, they were off. During the time necessary for preparation, Laurie bore himself as young gentlemen usually do in such cases. He was moody, irritable, and pensive by turns, lost his appetite, neglected his dress and devoted much time to playing tempestuously on his piano, avoided Joe but consoled himself by staring at her from his window, with a tragic face that taunted her dreams by night, and oppressed her with a heavy sense of guilt by day. Unlike some sufferers, he never spoke of his unrequited passion, and would allow no one, not even Mrs. Marsh, to tempt consolation or offer sympathy. On some accounts, this was a relief to his friends, but the weeks before his departure were very uncomfortable and everyone rejoiced that the poor, dear fellow was going away to forget his trouble, and come home happy. Of course, he smiled darkly at their delusion, but passed it by with the sad superiority of one who knew that his fidelity like his love was unalterable. When the pardon came he affected high spirits, to conceal certain inconvenient emotions, which seemed inclined to assert themselves. This gaiety did not impose upon anybody, but they tried to look as if it did for his sake, and he got on very well till Mrs. Marsh kissed him, with a whisper full of motherly solicitude. Then feeling that he was going very fast, he hastily embraced them all around, not forgetting the afflicted Hannah, and ran downstairs as if for his life. Joe followed a minute after to wave her hand to him if he looked round. He did look round, came back, put his arms about her as she stood on the step above him, and looked up at her with a face that made his short appeal eloquent and pathetic. Oh, Joe, can't you? Teddy, dear, I wish I could. That was all, except a little pause. Then Laurie straightened himself up, said, It's all right, never mind, and went away without another word. Ah, but it wasn't all right. And Joe did mind, for while the curly head lay on her arm a minute after her hard answer, she felt as if she had stabbed her dearest friend, and when he left her without a look behind him, she knew that the boy Laurie never would come again. Chapter 36 Beth's Secret When Joe came home that spring, she had been struck with the change in Beth. No one spoke of it, or seemed aware of it for it had come too gradually to startle those who saw her daily, but to as sharpened by absence, it was very plain, and a heavy weight fell on Joe's heart as she saw her sister's face. It was no paler and but little thinner than in the autumn, yet there was a strange, transparent look about it, as if the mortal was being slowly refined away, and the immortal shining through the frail flesh with an indescribably pathetic beauty. Joe saw and felt it, but said nothing at the time, and soon the first impression lost much of its power, for Beth seemed happy, no one appeared to doubt that she was better, and presently another cares Joe for time forgot her fear.